take your Bibles, if you have them, please, and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. The consequence of rebellion, this is part two. I regret that the two parts had to come over the course of a, of a, of a bit of a break, a, a one-week break in our meeting. I hope that um, that, that won't be too uh, consequential as it relates to the flow. Uh, last time, however, we were together, it is a little bit of a different part two. I didn't necessarily stop in the middle of a context to pick up the next week with an explanation. Uh, much to the rather, last time in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, we focused our time upon laying the foundation of understanding. This passage in Hebrews 10 is one of the more ambiguous passages in the Bible, specifically as it relates to um, the nature of man's relationship to God. Um, it's a passage that stretches our comprehension a little bit. It challenges our assumptions and, and it actively compels us to some study to understand it. We spent last time establishing two primary truths that lay the foundation for what we will build upon as we actually study this passage. First, that the simplicity and the clarity of the whole of the New Testament compels us to believe that once a person has accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ by grace through faith, he is then safe kept in that grace. He receives eternal life, which, as we argued, is only eternal if in fact he obtains eternal life. If he does not end up living forever, then he did not ever receive eternal life because it's not eternal if it doesn't end up being eternal, right? And we also talked about the nature of grace itself, that grace is unmerited favor, and that in fact, if a person did nothing and indeed could do nothing to qualify oneself to obtain the gift of grace, then it doesn't make sense that he can do anything then to, after the fact, disqualify himself from keeping that grace. He did not do anything to qualify for it, so how could he do something to disqualify himself from it? So we established what in theology and doctrine we call the doctrine of eternal security. Second, we contemplated the likelihood that Paul's warning and his exhortation here in Hebrews 10 is actually, it's not necessarily, it doesn't stand alone, but it's more likely, I believe, that it is an extension of the other warnings that we have seen throughout the book. It functions, in a sense, as a heightened elaboration upon the other two warnings that we have already considered in the book of Hebrews, found in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and found in Hebrews um, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And so we would fully expect to be able to take the conclusions and the lessons that have guided us in those first two warnings and apply them, or at least filter our understanding of Hebrews 10 through them as we consider this third warning. And we're attempting to cover a reasonable amount of ground. There's actually quite a bit here this evening, so I'm just going to jump right into it, and we're going to walk through this text. But what I'd like to do to begin is I'm actually going to start back further in the text for context, and we'll read, beginning in verse 19, we'll read all the way through uh, verse 27. The Bible says this in Hebrews 10. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries." 
So the context for Paul's warning following his exhortation unto obedience is those who would reject that call upon their lives to live in the manner that is reflected here in the text, that they would draw nigh and hold fast and provoke one another to assembling, that those who reject this call upon their lives are in a place that he calls sinning willfully. He says, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So within this context, within the context of this passage, the sinning willfully of which Paul speaks is related directly to the commands that have come before. He says, for if we sin willfully, it is, this is an extension of what he has said already. And he has said, because we have all of these blessings, because of the, the opportunity, because of the access that we have, do these things, draw nigh. Hold fast and provoke one another unto love and good works. Why? Because if we sin willfully, if we step outside of uh, not just these things, drawing nigh and holding fast and, and, and um, provoking one another, but if we, if we fall short, if we sin because we are not doing these things, if we do not draw nigh, if we do not hold fast our profession, if we do not provoke one another into love and good works, thus le uh, leaving ourselves in a place where we are stepping into willful sin, thus putting ourselves in a place where we fall to temptation, where we enter into uh, that place of rebellion or that place of apathy or that place of selfishness or that place of, uh, of, of well, sinfulness. If we do that, he says, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. We'll come to that in a moment. This idea, however, of falling short, of sinning willfully, this is somewhat of an extension of what we saw in chapter 2 and chapter 4 as it relates to those warnings. Remember in chapter 2, Paul said that we must take the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Right? And then remember in chapter 4, the call was that we would, um, that we would take heed that we do not come short of Christ's rest. And so we see the same warning, the idea of letting the doctrines of Christ slip, of letting the rest that is afforded to us, uh, that we would come short of that rest through unbelief. And we can recognize that same warning, that same pattern of warning here, that if we do not maintain that edge by drawing nigh and by uh, holding fast to our profession and by provoking one another to love and good works, and we end up letting those things slip, falling into sin, he says, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but only instead a fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now, this is why I laid that foundation last week. Remember the filter through which we are considering this text. Consider what you already know. First, what we covered last time about salvation. That as we understand salvation, salvation is by grace through faith. It is a one-time act of faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ after which we are born again, after which we are made a new creation in Christ, after which all those things that we talked about, right? And so as we consider that, there would have to be something very clear that would divert us from our understanding of eternal security. Now, the idea that we might uh, interpret this and thus uh, it would change our understanding of eternal security is a possibility. It's on the table if there's no other interpretive option for this passage. Except that there's most certainly other interpretive options for this passage. And that option is even in the very chapter of Scripture of which we're considering. And that's the next layer, right? So first we'll add that layer of doctrinal understanding. We understand that a person cannot lose their salvation through the whole of scriptural interpretation. And so it's going to take something dramatic to change that. Then the next thing we ask is, are there other interpretive possibilities here? And are those consistent with the text as we understand it? And if we go back in our context, in this very chapter we will find that context. We will find that hint as to what is being said here. And recall at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 10, Paul started Hebrews chapter 10 uh, with a contrast between the repetitive nature of sacrifices under the law and the once for all sacrifice of Christ. So Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 13, the Bible says this, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Perfect. 
For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers, once pur purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will O God above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldst not neither hast pleasure therein which are offered by the law then saith he lo I come to do thy will O God he taketh away the first that he may establish the second right he taketh away the sacrifices and offerings to establish the second I come to do thy will O Lord that's what he's saying there and we've already talked about that Verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Okay, so I read these verses so that you can see again and be reminded of this contrast. Perpetual sacrifices, daily, yearly, under the law, sacrifices given again and again and again, whereby there is a constant remembrance of sin every year because it is not possible that the blood of goats and of calves should take away sin. And he compares that with the once-for-all sacrifice, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, by which a remembrance of sin is put away forever, and it is, he, he has taken away sin, not just covered it, not just uh, um, cleansed it for a time, purging our conscience from dead works. And last time, in our, uh, when we considered the nature of salvation, we saw descriptions of what happens when one receives truth. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Ephesians chapter 4.30 said that we are sealed until the day of redemption. We enter into a life of grace, and we live in that grace. And as we enter into that grace, and we live in that grace, we re recognize the once-for-all finished work of Christ, the once-for-all sacrifice, sacrifice for our sins. We are freed from that anchor of sin, from the bondage of sin, from the guilt of sin, and we are thus raised to walk in newness of life. And in that the old things are passed away and that all things are become new, while most certainly the earthly consequences for past decisions might still linger on, right? We recognize that when a person accepts Christ, it doesn't mean that every earthly consequence of those sinful years is just going to go away. They're still going to have those things in their mind, and they're still going to have those, those associations, and they're still going to have those memories, and they're still going to have the, the, the um, elements of that life which might linger with them, perhaps physical consequences of such. There is a clean break from the old man that happens before the throne of grace, right? So think about this with me. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, old things are passed away, all things are become new. God does not hold the, the, the man who accepts Christ accountable for the sins of his unbelieving life. No man could stand before God if he was held to account for such things. And so there is this cleansing of the heart, this clean break, this old things passing away, this all things becoming new. Again, not necessarily meaning the physical consequences in this life all, all are, are, gone, are done away with, but the spiritual cleansing is total. Clean slate. But what if we, having received this truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ for ourselves having experienced redemption through Christ, having been set free from the bondage of our sin and the shame and the guilt of a life uh, of sin, saved from the darkness of our own deceived hearts, having had that clean break, that absolute forgiveness, old things are passed away, all things are become new, uh, that, that, that life that was before gone under the blood and this new life in Christ, what if then I place myself back under sin? What if I regress in grace and I begin to continue in sin that grace may abound? 
What if I regress in grace and I begin to place myself back under the legalities and the moralities of the, the law, trying to earn favor with God through my actions when I have already received salvation by grace through faith? Well, we've already set aside the idea that you lose that grace because that's not biblically sound. But if I do this thing, and Christ's sacrifice was a once-for-all idea, and I've already placed myself under that grace, and I've already experienced all the old things being passed away, and all things having become new, and then in that newness of life into which I am raised, I, I continue in sin that grace may abound, or I re-impose uh, upon myself a, a, a works-based idea of earning favor with God, well, I can no longer count on being born again again to clean the slate. There is, no more, there is not another cleaning of the slate. Old things passed away, all things became new once, just as Christ died once. Now, once again, follow me here. Nothing Paul is saying is speaking about whether or not a person goes to heaven. Remember the context of this chapter. The context of this chapter, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 13, began with a contrast between the perpetual sacrifices versus a once-for-all sacrifice. And, but if after my heart is cleansed, and all old things are passed away, and all things are become new, I then willingly taint it again, now, there is most certainly forgiveness to be found with the Lord through repentance. But there is no second sacrifice for those sins. I own that sin on the day of judgment. And this is what Paul is speaking of here. When I stand before the Lord in judgment, I will not account for the sins that took place prior to my salvation. There's nothing in the scriptures that implies that the sins that, that happened prior to my salvation will be there on the day of judgment. Because those things are passed away, all things are become new. That grace that I receive at the moment of salvation, that clean slate that I receive, that cleansing of the heart that I receive, there is nothing in uh, metaphor, there is nothing in direct teaching that implies that those sins that I commit prior to my salvation will be a part of the reckoning of the day of judgment. But what about those sins that I commit after grace? There is no second sacrifice for those sins. I own those. <laughs> now again, as it relates to my relationship with the Lord, if I confess my sin, He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9 makes that clear. And again, I'm also not talking about a person going to hell. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says this beginning in verse 11. And I apologize, I don't have this on a slide. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Paul is describing the nature of the believer standing before the judgment seat there. This is not speaking about unbelievers. Unbelievers, uh, that, that's a different ballgame. But when he's speaking of believers, he says that every man will appear before the judgment seat of Christ and, what will, uh, the, and that the day will declare our works. And that on that day there will be a pile of what he says are gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. And the fire of God's wrath will fall upon that, of God's judgment will fall upon that pile, and whatever's left over will be reward. And whatever gets burned up is loss. It's lost before the throne. Now, everything prior to Christ is lost, right? That's, that's, that's prior to Christ. But there is no reward prior to Christ. Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Because without faith it is impossible to please him. 
So it is not until I step into faith that any rewards begin to happen. And as I said, there's nothing necessarily in Scripture that implies that any of those works done prior will even be there on the Day of Judgment, save for the unbeliever, where all of their works will be sin. But for the believer who is in Christ, the moment he steps into Christ, if old things are passed away and all things are become new, then those works those unbelieving works, those works outside of faith, they go away, and now there's a clean slate, but what if I begin to pile upon that clean slate wood, hay, and stubble? Well, there's no second sacrifice for that sin. Christ died once for all. Grace is a once for all proposition. I step into it once, and I, it stays forever. Right? I am in grace forever. I am safe, kept in grace forever. I am eternally secure. But the reality of eternal security also means there's no second sacrifice. And because there's no second sacrifice, that means that wood, hay, and stubble will be accounted for on the day of judgment. And that's what Paul is saying here. That if I sin willfully after I've received the knowledge of the truth, there is no sacrifice for sins again. There's no second sacrifice. There's no second cleaning of the slate. Instead, there is a certain looking for of judgment and a fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. The sin prior to salvation, it rests under the cross. But once I am saved, 1 Corinthians 3 teaches, I begin to store up reward and loss before the throne. And I must answer to God for that. And if I, after salvation, choose to reject the ideas of grace and embrace the law once again, or choose to fall headlong into abuse of grace unto the satisfaction of my flesh, now there's always forgiveness. There's always repentance. There's always a cleansing of my heart and a restoration of the relationship with the Lord. But that sin is wood, hay, and stubble. And on the day of judgment and fiery indignation, we will answer for that sin. Not unto uh, eternal damnation. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 3, Uh, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Right? Doesn't say that he will end up in perdition. But it will be a fiery passage through, through that time of judgment. And this is the warning here. If we sin willfully... After that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. Not gained it, but received it. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Christ did it once for all. You received it one time. The slate was cleansed. Everything was put under the cross. A new ledger was opened. But if then, at that point, you sin willfully, there's coming a day where you'll account for that on the day of judgment. So we continue in verses 28 through 31. Paul says, He that despised Moses' law without mercy under two or three witnesses uh, uh, died. Excuse me. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. An important word to keep in there. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God? And hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We often get this picture, and we've talked about this before. We often get this picture uh, of, of this idea that when a person accepts Christ, we kind of, if our children accept Christ, we kind of breathe a sigh of relief and say, oh, okay, they're going to heaven now. And, and we, we have a, a feeling of perhaps pressure taken off of us or, or a fear taken off of our chest that they've accepted Christ as their Savior and they're going to heaven. And we think of heaven and we think of the glories and the joys of heaven and we think of bliss and, and uh, we, we think of all of those wonderful things and we have a tendency to overlook that day of judgment. 
We have a tendency to overlook just how important obedience and sanctification is to the believer because there is coming a day of judgment and we will be a part of that day. We will be judged. And in the same manner that going all the way back to Hebrews chapter 2, Paul painted that contrast where he said that he talked about the angels and he talked about the nature of the angels under the law and he talked about the fiery mountain of Sinai and he, he talked about the, the law being given by the disposition of angels and he talked about how holy that was and he said, and if Christ is superior, then imagine how much more holy. Imagine how much more we should take heed to the things which we have heard lest we should let them slip because the angel was, if the angel that, that, that disposed of the law was that holy, how much more so Christ? And he's saying the same thing here. He's using that same kind concept here, that same analogy, uh, comparing Moses' law, which again, Moses' law uh, has been fulfilled in Christ. That went away so that the better could come, right? So now we have the better. And if we have the better, how much more accountable will we be if we scorn the better? than the one who scorned the law, which was the picture, just the shadow. How much more accountable are we who have the fullness of grace? If, that reje if the rejection of the law of Moses for those of Israel who bound themselves to that covenant, who it testified unto, uh, well, when, when it was testified unto before two or three witnesses, if that brought death without any mercy, if it was that, that severe, that two or three witnesses before the law of a breach of the law could bring about a person's death. How much sore punishment will we who have entered into the covenant with Christ through his blood be thought worthy if we tread underfoot grace that has been purchased for us? If I count the blood of Christ's covenant whereby I have been sanctified as an unholy thing, if I take that which is holy and which is sanctified and I treat it with contempt, this actually is reflected in the Lord's table and in the warnings of the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 11, is it not? That Paul says that because they did not discern the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus properly, some, many were sickly among them and some even died. Some had even slept, he says in 1 Corinthians 11. That is a visible manifestation of this exact principle that Paul is warning about here. That if we tread underfoot this spirit of grace, we should expect that that is going to come with dramatic consequences. I can't just walk through life saying, well, I've got my fire insurance. Well, I've been saved. I'm good now. I can do whatever I want. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, it doesn't work that way, right? And this is what Paul is emphasizing here. It does not work that way. And much to the contrary, we ought to be, among anyone in the world, fearful of sinning. Because how much sore punishment will come to those who have taken that which is sanctified and holy and treated it as unholy and trodden underfoot, he says, the Son of God. Now again, this sounds very lose your salvation e. And absent the rest of the New Testament, we might conclude this. And absent the immediate context, we might be tempted to change our understanding of the rest of the New Testament to conform to this. But in the context of Hebrews, we find that message to be about living in the power of the faith into which we have been ushered. Living in the rest that Christ has purchased for us, rather than wandering in the wilderness of our sinful choices. Though we've already been brought out of the sin slavery of Egypt, yet we need to enter into that rest. And in that, this is the argument and this is the context, we reframe our mindset away from the idea that Paul is warning us about the lake of fire and instead finding him warning about this other way that we can tread upon the Son of God and do despite to grace. Perhaps even more startling, more intimidating. What if, what if, when God said in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. What if when God said that to Israel, he was not talking about him recompensing Egypt, or Ammon, or Moab? What if he was talking about 
how he will treat his own people if they reject him. So we read in Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. And we say, Amen. Go get them, God. Avenge me! Right? Until we read the next verse. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that that power is gone and that there is none shut up or left. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, God. So you mean that when God says, vengeance belongs to me, I will repay, he wasn't just speaking of the heathen. He wasn't just speaking of those guys in Washington that we don't like. He wasn't just speaking about that neighbor that lets his dog out to ruin your flowers. He wasn't just speaking of those things. You mean, in fact, in, in this context, he was saying, I will judge my people? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. I will judge my people? And we say, well, where do we come up with this in the New Testament? Well, we see it here in, in, in Hebrews 10. We also find it in Romans chapter 12, right? And in Romans 12, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men and such. But then we start to think about the context of Romans 12, and we say, well, yeah, Romans 12 toward the end kind of broadens its horizons a little bit, but actually the context of Romans 12 is teaching believers how they should interact one with another. And it's actually within the context of him saying, this is how you should act in the church. Members one of another that he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And we start to realize that maybe I need to start looking inward when I read those words, vengeance is mine, I will repay, rather than looking outward. Now, it's a great comfort to look outward. And, and, and it's true, the Lord will avenge his people. But the Lord shall also judge his people. And in fact, the primary focus of this promise, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, is a promise of God to judge his own people. And that's what we find here when Paul invokes it in Hebrews 10. What if when, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible tells us that judgment must begin at the house of God, Peter wasn't fooling. So that when you should, when you think about these things and when we step into life, we should be afraid of stepping into sin. Not just that we should not like sin, not just that we should recognize that we shouldn't sin, but that the thought of stepping into open rebellion against God should make us fearful, like shaking fearful, afraid. Because we know that there is a day of judgment and that there is no more sacrifice for sin for we who are in Christ. Now once again, take that in the context of what I've said, in the context of Hebrews 10. There is no sacrifice for sin. It was once for all. You've received it once for all. You're going to heaven. That slate was clean once. Now you're building up gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Because God is going to judge you for that sin. And though you may repent and realign and submit, which of course you should and we all should and realign and get back within uh, the, the, the relationship with the Lord and, and uh, stop grieving and quenching the Spirit of God, there is no second sacrifice for those sins. They are on the record now and they will be there on that day of judgment. The fiery indignation of God will fall upon your works upon that day and it will be a fearful thing. Because it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. And this should both compel us and constrain us to renew in our hearts a passion, to remember our first love. And this is what Paul says next, in verses 32 to 35. But call to remembrance the former days, in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. 
For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence which hath great recompense of reward. Don't, uh, don't, don't forget that along with that wood, hay, and stubble, there's also gold, silver, and precious stones. Don't forget that when you don't cast aside the things of Christ, when you commit yourself to them, there is great reward. And remember those former days, Paul says. Do you remember those early days of your salvation? Paul asks them, and I ask you, now, this group of Hebrew believers, to this group, Paul describes those early days after the Spirit illuminated their heart to truth. And, and there's a uniqueness to, to their testimony, and maybe it's yours as well. But he describes their time. He must have been there because he describes it clearly. He says that their hearts were illuminated and then they endured great fights of affliction. They were persecuted after that probably by their family, by their friends, by their co-workers. If he, he's speaking to a Jewish audience here, it, perhaps he's speaking in Jerusalem. Perhaps he's speaking to them when he came back to Jerusalem that final time and he brought with them that, that, that uh, offering from Corinth and from, from Philippi and all of those churches. And maybe he brought it and then he's preaching to them and he says, do you remember those early days? After you got saved and your family disowned you and you lost your job and you lost everything? You lost, your, 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 your parents disinherited you. You had great f uh, fights of affliction. And then some of, you, some of you were made gazing stocks. You had reproaches. And then others of you, you didn't have it so hard yourself, but you became companions to those who did. And you willingly gave of the things that you still had to give to those that didn't have. Like in those early days in the book of Acts when they sold their possessions and they gave to the apostles and the apostles delegated deacons so that they could distribute to the needs of the saints because so many saints in that time were in such hard shape because they had accepted Christ as their Savior and they were being afflicted and they were losing out on their jobs and, and on their livelihood and, and their families and their support systems and everything. And Paul says, you took and you spoiled your goods joyfully. Knowing that in yourselves, uh, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance, so you gave of the things of this earth for the things of the life that is to come. He says, "Do you remember those days? Don't, don't give that up. Come back to that. Remember that again." Paul says, "You did that for me." Paul was an outcast for his faith, yet they loved him and they gave to him. They sacrificed for him in this state of zeal and love because they knew that there was a reward in heaven and that reward was worth it. What a contrast that can happen in the Christian life. What a contrast between that Christian when we see and they're young and they're zealous and they're doing what's right and they're casting aside. Joel and I were talking about that this afternoon. That in those times of spiritual zeal, there is nothing that you would cling to if it would separate you in any way, shape, or form from Christ, it can all go. I count it but dung that I may win Christ, as Paul said in Philippians. And then the next day you can wake up and you can say, ah, there's grace. I want to do that. I want to think that. I want to go there. I want to say that. I want to be there. I want to be doing that thing. There's grace. And you do despite to grace. But do you remember that time? Do you remember that zeal? Don't cast that away, Paul says. Hold tight to that. Don't just settle in your Christian life, content with the routines of piety, while the embers of your heart, which were once aflame with love and desire for Christ, fade into coldness, apathy, and then eventually and inevitably back into the sin from which you have been set free. Reinvigorate your love, renew your passion, your joy, your boldness, your confidence. Let me say this. We have many second and third generation Christians among us, saved as children. Now, I remember the early days of vigor and of love and faith, which were manifest in my children's lives for those who have accepted Christ, my, my three oldest. 
I remember their zeal, but they likely will not. And this is something that they will struggle. My wife and I were both saved at a young age, as my wife and I would struggle to remember that early zeal. When I think back to zeal, I actually think back to the time where I yielded all to Christ when I was 19. When I, when I sold out, when I gave in, in, in a renewed way. That's what I think back to. I don't actually think back to my point of salvation. I don't have a lot of memories of that. Uh, and of course, even then, the change would, was not particularly dramatic because I was so young. And so, in one sense, it's a bit unfortunate. And as I'm preaching to this group, there's not necessarily a, a, a great number of people in this group that when Paul says, remember those former days when you were first illuminated, you can do that with power. And yet, you can think back to those times of zeal. Some of you can remember that time of illumination. And may I say this as well. As we would seek parents to help our children who were saved at a young age into this place of zeal and of love, the way to avoid the, the, the dangers of, of losing that or not having that for our children is not to avoid leading our children to the Lord until they're older and they've had enough sins that they can, they can experience the change. But rather, the way to avoid that is to foster a lifestyle whereby your family and your lives are zealous. And the zeal of your life and your love for Christ is maintained so that they don't have to think back to the former, those first days to see zeal. They can look at you. And then they can forge those memories of zealous, joyful, powerful love themselves. And it's a renewed, constant love because their parents have spread that fire to them and that zeal to them. And of course, that is the call here, is it not? To renew that. And as we renew it, everyone will see that. A call to patience, steadfast, determined obedience, and love for the Lord. Paul then says in verses 36 through 39, For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he shall come, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. That's Christ's second coming. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Ye have need of patience. The idea here, ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. This word patience in this context is not the idea uh, simply of waiting, but it's actually the idea of enduring. Once again, Paul is calling them unto a zeal. If they renew that zeal in their hearts, it's quite possible that with that renewed zeal would come renewed affliction. Maybe it is that they had settled in their lives uh, back into, of course, we know that Hebrews is speaking about the dangers of, of falling back into the Mosaic way of thinking, right? The legal way of thinking. Maybe it is that these Jews, these Jewish believers had actually been tempted to fall back into that way of thinking, specifically to avoid affliction, avoid persecution. And as Paul exhorts them to reinvigorate grace, reinvigorate their, their zeal, and by the way, how are they supposed to do that? Draw nigh, hold fast the profession, not forsake the assembling of yourselves. To, uh, um, no, no, provoke one another to love and good works by not forsaking the assembling of, your love, of yourselves together. That's how we invigorate this. One of us catches on fire, and then that fire spreads. And so we do this, and as, as they were to do this, Paul says, and you're going to have need of patience, endurance, that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Remember that there could be affliction here. If you're going to finish the race, you must have endurance. And then he warns them again, that those who draw back, the Lord has no pleasure in them, but rather what is to be expected. Judgment. Judgment. 
And we've already described what that judgment is. That as we see this contrast here between perdition and the saving of the soul, remember that idea of salvation is not just eternal life. That idea of salvation is healing, is blessing, is any number of, uh, of possible things. And as we compare Scripture with Scripture and we filter this through our understanding of salvation, then we filter this through 1 Corinthians 3 and, and as we talked about 1 Peter 4 and as we filter it through these things, we come to the idea here that this per perdition versus the saving is not hell versus heaven, but this is wood, hay, and stubble versus gold, silver, and precious stones. And we know this, Romans 11:6 6 says plainly, if by grace there is no, it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no, by, no more grace. If it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. We have been saved by grace, therefore it's not of work. But if you want the promised rewards that come to the believer, those rewards do demand that you put in the work, don't they? And believe Paul when he says that you really want those rewards. First, because if you turn back, what awaits you is a day of fearful judgment unlike anything that you can possibly imagine. The words that Paul uses here are stern words, are they not? He says that those who turn back, they trodden underfoot the, the Son of God. They do despite to grace. These are strong words. It's a strong warning. But second, because 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Don't forget, yes, be fearful because of the day of judgment, but every moment that you walk in faith, and, and we're going to understand what that is starting next time in Hebrews 11, right? Every moment that you walk in faith, every moment that you hold fast to that profession, every moment that you maintain that love, every moment that you draw nigh and you hold fast the profession and you provoke one another to love and good works and you live in love and good works, that moment is a moment of reward. And just as we can rest assured that that day of judgment is something that we cannot fully comprehend, but it's going to be, it's going to be something awful. Fearful. Because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So too, those rewards, that gold, silver, and precious stones, you cannot... I, my children have pretty good imaginations. A lot of people in here probably have pretty good imaginations. Your imagination cannot get anywhere close to what God has prepared for them that love Him. It can't touch it. And this is that call. It ought to literally make me tremble with fear to step willingly, knowingly into sin. But it ought to make me excited beyond measure to step into the rewards of, of, of that day. And for we who are in Christ, we know this to be true. You know the joy of following Christ. You've experienced it if you are in Christ. You remember the promise of reward which compelled you to forsake all and follow Him. Reinvigorate that love. Rekindle that fire. Because as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, and as we'll consider throughout Hebrews 11, the reward is beyond worth it. They are so worth it, in fact, that as we considered this morning in Romans 8, verse 18, Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And if you're a believer... There was a time when you knew this to be true. And if as a believer, that time is not right now because you have fallen into some measure of apathy or rebellion or selfishness or sin, you're in a fearful place. You need to repent. You need to return. There's no second sacrifice for sin, but there is still mercy to be found with the Lord. Repent. Return. Return. 
Because not only are the promises of God worth it all, but we are reminded that if we sin willfully, the only thing that will be there for that act is a fearful and fiery looking for of judgment. Saved, yes, but as 1 Corinthians 15 says, saved yet so as by fire. You don't want to be saved yet so as by fire. You don't want that fate that need not be your fate. You want to be saved into all the glorious promises and rewards of Christ. And so, Christian, that's the exhortation. That's what Paul is saying here. That is why he compels us to draw nigh, to um, hold fast to our profession, and to provoke one another into love and good works. That we be not among those who sin willfully and end up in that place of rebellion and end up in that place where we have lost sight of the rewards, Re, but, but rather to reinvigorate those, the, the, that, that passion, that first love, and endure so that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.